we have Pharisee parts that would love to throw stones at our pornography addicted parts and would love to murder them and kick them out and get rid of them and not affiliate with them. And those parts need our love and compassion and unburdening. And so do the parts that are desperate and on the ground and covered in blood and terrified that keep going back to the pornography or the sexual acting out. And Jesus brings love and the healing presence of his connection and compassion to both that de-escalates the battle and invites healing and unburdening. Welcome back to Husband Material. I am super excited to have back on the show for the second year in a row, Jenna Reemersma. Welcome, Jenna. Thank you so much, Drew. I love what you're doing with Husband Material, and I'm so excited to be with you today. Thanks. I'm excited, too. Um, in case you guys didn't know, Jenna is the author of this book, All Together You, which is all about experiencing personal and spiritual transformation with internal family systems therapy. This is something that I first learned about from Jenna in the pastoral sex addiction professional program. And it's also continued to be a huge part of my life. Personally, it has influenced the work that I do, specifically your Christ-centered approach to it. Thank you so much. I wanted to say thank you on behalf of all the husband material guys too, because they get to benefit. And uh, if you guys don't have this book all together, you get it. It is incredible. It is the top book that I recommend that's not specifically about porn addiction, but it applies. It applies so well. So first of all, let's start out talking about what is this internal family systems therapy thing? Yeah, it's kind of a crazy, uh, crazy uh, name for a framework, but thank you so much for your kind words about the book. And I just want to um, pay tribute backwards to those who've handed it to me. Dr. Richard Schwartz is the originator of the model of internal family systems therapy, which he kind of uh, discovered about 40 years ago. And uh, he is truly just groundbreaking and, and it has changed my entire life and my entire clinical practice and my faith journey and my struggles and all every, every aspect of my life. So I pay homage to Dr. Schwartz and his groundbreaking work. And the idea at a super high level be behind internal family systems is that inside of us is an internal system of many different parts. So uh, it's contrasted with what we would call the monolithic view of humanity, which is I am just one entity. And when we think as a monolith, we over identify with things that we're feeling or things that we're doing. So we will say things like, I am an addict, or I am anxious, or I am uh, depressed. We will make global statements about who we are that really just reflect what one part of us is feeling or thinking or doing. Or I am attracted to this type of porn, or I can't get over this, or I am so hopeless. Exactly. Exactly. And the, the reality is that those feelings, those beliefs, those behaviors are simply uh, held by parts of us, but they're not all of who we are. A part of us may feel hopeless and another part may feel excited and energized or hopeful. And so the, the complexity of the human experience um, is really reflected beautifully in the internal family systems or IFS model. And uh, it basically just tells us what, I don't know, you and I probably already know, which is I have many different parts and they kind of want to do many different things. <laughs> and those things are often at war with each other. I have one part of me that wants to eat the entire box of Oreos all in one sitting. And I have another part of me that wants me to only eat kale and go to the gym. And those two parts of me are at war. And that's pretty daggum normal. And that's why we experience with, uh, with, many different folks, this, this juxtaposition of, you know, people come in and say, I, I have, you know, a part of me keeps going back to looking at porn and another part of me is horrified. 
and super upset about it and upset about how I'm harming my relationships and wasting my time and going against my faith or my moral perspectives. But this other part of me keeps going back to the porn. Well, it's kind of like my Oreo conundrum. We all have different parts of ourselves and they're trying to help us in many different ways. And those parts are often at war and that's a normal state of being human. And there's nothing wrong with you or me if we have parts at war. Um, it's just really a reflection of how I envision our being created in the image of a triune God. We serve one God who has three different parts and that God puts us into one body of Christ with many different parts. So it makes sense that I am one person with many different parts because I'm created in the image of God yeah. who operates like that. <laughs> totally. And I even, I love the way that uh, the the traditional Christian creeds put it, that that God is actually three persons. And that even to me speaks more to th that we have these personalities. Yeah. Um, you know, and we have these like little people inside of us, which m makes me feel kind of crazy to talk that way. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And they're, of course, not not literal little people. We don't have little minion, minions inside of us. But the experience that a, a part of us carries one portion of our life experience, our memories, our feelings, our beliefs, our behaviors, and another part carries some different ones. And it turns out that that complexity is very much in keeping with our understanding of our neurobiological uh, experience and trauma and faith. And really through the lens of Christianity and Christian belief, it's very, very congruent. And yes. it also is radically hopeful and encouraging when we look at chronic struggles, such as pornography addiction. Um, when we think that that is who we are and we over identify with it so we'll hear sometimes well i am you know my name is joe and i am a porn addict um, that can feel a bit hopeless i understand the intent behind it is to break through denial and to kind of you know come to grips with the consequences of the behavior and that's very valid and very important and that's not all of who you are. That's not all of who Joe is. Um, you know, there's also a person of faith in there or a, a wonderful loving husband or a father or a boyfriend or a son or, you know, a hard worker or a artist or visionary. And, um, and we can draw from all of those parts. But the even better news is that behind, if you will, all of these parts of you and me, at the very center of who we are is not a part, it's our core. And that core in IFS terms is called our self, our authentic self. And we in Christendom really hate that word because self has kind of become synonymous with sin or flesh. And we just kind of go a little bit offline when we hear the word self. So I wanna just give everybody permission to kind of translate that word. I translate it as the God image. So it's who you and I really are. We're image bearers of God. And at our core, that's who we are. And because that's the image of God, and that's who we really are, it is fundamentally good. It cannot be distorted, no matter how much trauma we've experienced, and no matter how many bad or wonky things parts of us have done. And yes. golly, we've all experienced a lot of trauma, and all of us have parts that have done and felt wonky things. And that does not change the essence of the quality of the God image inside of you and me. And it's actually the God image from which we can lead our best life. And that is the magic, I think, of our faith. And it's also the magic of IFS. IFS provided, when I encountered IFS, it provided a way of living out my faith and entering into my struggles infinitely more successfully and with so much grace um, in the way that my faith orientation had promised. Um, but IFS sort of allows us to put, you know, uh, put meat on it. Yes. To me, it has actually felt even more Christ-centered than much of what I thought I knew from Christianity. Yes. Yeah. So the idea that within me, there is a core which is fundamentally good. 
feels like it's in violation of that doctrine of original sin. Yes. But really, it's actually what Richard Schwartz calls original blessing. Hmm. He's like, this is a neglected teaching of Christianity that we need to recover, that God created everyone good in his image. And that's actually more core to who we are, is goodness. It's like, wait, what? That's right. Exactly. And for those who have this concern, which is very appropriate because the fundamental depravity of man um, and the doctrine of original sin is very uh, integral to, you know, sort of Catholicism, Christianity, as we know it in our, in, in our postmodern times. Um, and I would suggest that uh, those burdens, the burden of sin, or what I as a clinician would call the burden of trauma, and those words to me mean the same thing, things are not as they should be, okay, in Christendom we call that missing the mark, in, in therapy I call it trauma, um, but it's our parts that carry that burden, not our God image. And so, yes, we have fundamental depravity of man because our parts carry the burden of sin, the burden of trauma, and they become distorted by that. They lose access to the positive qualities that are underneath the trauma. Those positive qualities are still there, but we lose access to them until they become unburdened. And they do not touch the goodness and the beauty and the healing power of the God image inside of me and inside of you. And it is that God image that actually connects us to our authentic spirituality, which I love because I have a part that I never understood before. That is a part that's been burdened by trauma that has tried to help me do my faith right, quote unquote, by doing, saying, repeating lots of really good and wonderful spiritual things to try to squinch me on closer over there to God so that God's really happy with me and my faith community is really happy with me and I don't screw it up and, and get damned to hell uh, or disappoint God or, or sully his image or reputation. And it's a really wonderful part of me. I call it my spiritualizer part and it's efforting. And it's efforting to try to help me avoid pain or shame or rejection or fear. And um, it has very black and white thinking. This is the in crowd. This is the out crowd. This, these are okay sins. These are not okay sins. It's, it, it's very much filled with kind of a spirit and an energy of inside the box, outside the box, and sort of judgment and evaluation of me and of others. And that is because it's really critical for this part. In order to be able to protect me from doing it wrong, it has to know which is right and which is wrong. And so I totally get it. It's just a wonderful part of me, but it is not my authentic connection to the divine. It's a spiritualizer part. It's a part that's trying to help me do it right by saying and doing all the Christian things, but it's doing so in an effort to protect me from pain which is very different than a sincere and authentic connection to the divine. And that is a game changer in, in my own faith journey and my own struggles because my spiritualizer part doesn't much like the parts of me that are doing and feeling wonky and unpleasant things. It wants to kick them out of my system. And uh, once I began to realize that that was not actually my authentic spirituality, it was very freeing. Yeah. I can see how that spiritualizer part would have some harsh words and feelings toward sexually acting out with porn, for example. And maybe that spiritualizer part would motivate you to get into some kind of recovery program or, or even listen to this podcast because I hate porn and I'm trying so hard to get rid of it and eliminate it from my life. And I even had a client yesterday who told me, he wants to work with me because he just wants to get rid of those sexual urges and those sexual attractions that have been plaguing him. And inside I'm thinking to myself, all right, I'm meeting, I'm meeting a part of him which is really afraid and trying to protect a more wounded part, a younger part, a part that really needs some love. And so part of what we wanted to do with this episode is something that Jenna, you talked about at one of our recent consultations, which was 
how to tell the difference between the spiritualizer or the the manager or the the part that's just trying to get rid of this behavior and my true authentic core self because you're saying that there is a core beneath all of my parts and if we could just access that core the christ in me yes then it would be like a superpower <laughs> We could bring healing to the whole system. How do we tell the difference and how do we access that core self? It's such an important question. Not only how do we access this inner superpower of Christ in me, it's a Galatians 5 kind of a thing where the fruit of the spirit just comes bubbling out of us, poof. <laughs> and my spiritualizer part always got a little frustrated with that scripture. And it's like, ah, it doesn't just poof bubble out of me like that. Um, and that's because my spiritualizer efforts, but when I'm connected to the, to the vine, quote, or to the God image inside of me, it does spontaneously erupt because that's the nature of who I am and who you are. And we can't help it. It's just there. And when our parts feel honored and cared for, they relax and that comes forward. It emits. Um, so it's really beautiful. And it's such an important question because most of us do not live day to day out of the overflow of the God image inside of us. We want to, I mean, I want to, um, and most people I meet would really like to do that. And we're trying, but it, it feels like a lot of effort and exhausting and frustrating because we fall down all the time, or at least I do. And I think that it's really valuable to get a little bit of a sense of what these parts of us are and, and how they operate and how we can know the difference. So our God image, uh, Dick Schwartz discovered in talking with many, many, many clients that this God image, when people's parts felt respected and cared for, they, they calmed down and they relaxed back and this God image, the self came forward and it always contained what he named the eight C qualities. And these are qualities like calm, clear mindedness, compassion, courage, connection to others. That's a really big one. Can I just go on a, a, a short rant? Um, I love this because the connection to others is something that our, our culture is losing um, as we become more polarized around divisive political issues, issues of global health and pandemic. Um, we very much get into these entrenched views of us versus them or right versus wrong or me versus you. And those are parts. Our God image does not see humanity in that way. Our God image sees we. There's this deep connection and compassion and empathy and love and curiosity that is at the core of who we all are. And uh, that, you know it when you feel it. <laughs> it is the most beautiful thing. And many of us have experienced this often in a, a worship setting perhaps or a retreat where we, we often call it a mountaintop experience with God. And it's, it's something that transcends words. It is not an intellectual understanding. It's not something that really lends itself well to verbal description. It's an energy. It's a physiological, like an overflow of a sense of love and um, deep grace and connection and peace. And it's transcendent. It, it transcends words. And uh, it's very powerful. And it's inside of all of us all of the time we simply lose access to it sometimes. That's so wild. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. It, it's easy to forget that we all have that inside of us. Even the person on the other side of the conversation that you disagree with the most, wherever you happen to fall in the conversation, that person has it inside of them too. And so do you and I, and oh my goodness, isn't that encouraging? But we lose access to it because our vulnerable parts become burdened or covered over, almost like putting on a cloak, um, where they become covered over with the trauma experiences. And so a good part, like let's say a, a young, playful, spontaneous part of me might experience shaming or harm in some way, and it gets covered over with shame or some of our trauma messages, things like, I'm powerless, my feelings and needs don't matter, I'm broken, there's something wrong with me. If you really knew me, you wouldn't love me. 
these are very common trauma messages that take over young parts of us and those parts of us get stuck at the period of time at which the burden happens. And when they get triggered and take us over, we now no longer feel spontaneous, playful, and innocent. Mm -hmm. We feel shame, broken, powerless, worthless. And that's a terrible feeling. And so these protective parts of us, we call them managers and firefighters. Managers try to prevent us from feeling those feelings and firefighters try to put them out when they happen. And they're burdened also. They're also good parts of us that take on roles to, as a result of this trauma that are not who they really are. And so we have manager parts like control, people pleasing, perfectionism, spiritualizing that are like, uh uh, we're not going to feel that again. I'm going to do this Christian thing perfectly so that I never have to feel shame. I am going to do it right. And um, gosh, I get that, but that's got a lot of striving and efforting involved in it. And when eventually it fails and it always will, then the firefighter parts jump in. They're reactive. They try to put out the pain. And these are all the things like drinking alcohol, acting out with pornography, um, self-harm, dissociating, suicidal ideation. These are the reactive parts that are like, oh, heck no. Yeah. We got to put out that pain. Like we can't be feeling that shame, that rejection. And I like to call those parts the pacifiers. I love it. Because they're coming to the little boy yes, with something, just something to try to address that pain. Absolutely. And a couple of really critical things about both types of these protective parts. Um, number one is none of them like the job that they've gotten stuck with. That's a really refreshing thing to know. Like the part of you that is seeking porn to help make the feelings of rejection or worthlessness feel better for a minute, doesn't even want to be doing the porn seeking. It just doesn't know another way. And I want to pause there because that is why informing ourselves that this is a problem. You really shouldn't be doing this. Do you see how it's destroying your life? That just deepens the self-contempt. That's right. Because they already know that. That's right. Yeah. And, and when we pile on shame, um, even well-intentioned, like, uh, you know, let's, let's not hurt your future spouse or, you know, it, even well-intentioned and, and all of that is correct. And what it's doing is it's heaping more shame on the part that already feels the shame, which makes the porn addicted part have to act out more. It actually is reinforcing the dilemma. And we want to do the reverse of that. And I've got a way at the end of the episode that I will give people a little, a little shorthand that I've created for how to do that. Um, but another important thing to know, be, well, let me just say a little bit more about the parts not wanting to do what they're doing. For example, a part that's gotten taken over by porn seeking, often if we lift up the cloak of that trauma and we see what that part was actually designed by God to do, it often is a part that is designed to do the opposite. It's designed to seek out healthy intimacy, for example, or perhaps it's a part that is designed by God to embrace an embodied sensuality. Um, it, it may be a part that is just, you know, in some way deeply connected to bodily sensuality or sexuality or intimacy. And it has gotten hijacked by the immediacy of the dopamine response of porn into a repetitive porn seeking to try to meet those intimacy needs or those sensual needs of body care. Um, but it is doing it in a way that makes it better in the short run mm. and makes it worse in the long run. And all of the parts, proactive and reactive, that is true of their behavior. Control, people pleasing, spiritualizing, looking at porn, drinking a glass of alcohol. It makes us feel better for a hot second. And then five minutes later, three months later, it makes it a whole lot worse. And that's a universal truth. And even that part of me that feels motivated to stop using porn and for the next week or for the next month, I'm going to abstain. That might have a little bit of a short-term gain. It might actually help you a little bit and therefore can masquerade 
as the core self. That's right. And in fact, it's just parts at war. And that's why New Year's resolutions don't work. Getting on the wagon doesn't work. That's why relapse rates are very high. If we're engaging in a war of parts and the only thing we're doing is we're aligning with the proactive parts, the parts that want to do it right, please God, you know, not mess up. Um, We can muscle over the reactive parts for a while, but the reactive parts still are there and need to do their job. And the answer is instead of moving against them, it's actually to move toward them with curiosity and compassion in the God image. Yes. Okay. And I want to put that a different way. Instead of fighting the battle for purity and instead of conquering my sin, what if we could stop fighting that battle altogether? What if we could be peacemakers in this war? Then we could actually put down the pacifier. So show us the way. Yes. Well, you know what's coming up for me is the the visceral graphic. If you'll just step back with me into the pages of scripture and imagine the horrific scene. I mean, like really imagine it. I tend to gloss it over because it's so familiar, but just think about the woman caught in adultery and by caught what we really are saying is set up and then pulled out into the public square because very unlikely that they were just randomly catching this person and there's a crowd of people and there's yelling and screaming and all the emotionality of self-righteous parts spiritualizing parts and notice the energy of we're right and you're wrong we're holy you're sinful notice that energy and notice the contrast between the energy of the Pharisees, the murderous spiritualizing Pharisees. And that's not who the Pharisees were, by the way, but they had some pretty strong burden parts, I would guess, by reading the text and the energy of Christ. And notice that the energy of Christ toward the Pharisees in their murderous spiritualizing parts and the energy toward the woman who was caught and condemned in her sexual acting out parts and the deep compassion and invitation to introspection that he offered to both. He could have gone off on either of them with, with incredible, you know, righteousness. And instead he chose to say to the Pharisees, gentlemen, let's take a U-turn Okay, and that's our little magic word from IFS, which means instead of sending all of your energy out at this other person or event or situation, let's gently return it to you, take a U-turn and get curious about what is coming up in me. And so the one of you who doesn't have any sin coming up inside of you, go ahead and just, just lob that stone. Just you go for it. He just simply extended this gentle invitation to a U-turn to really invite them to look at the burdened parts of them that were coming up in righteousness, that were fighting the adultery, right? That's that's how we war against our pornography-seeking parts, wanting to kill them and throw them out and all the things. And then he turned to the woman who in that moment, I have to assume may have had a burdened part that was trying to help her, let's say, get her needs for intimacy, attachment, safety met by sexually connecting with someone outside of matrimony. And he tenderly, I imagine, knelt down, took her face and said, neither do I condemn you. And many people like to say, yeah, 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 but don't forget, he said, go and sin no more. And do you know what I think he, how that might have sounded is this encounter with the God image, the God essence, when the God essence has the interaction with our burdened parts, there is healing that takes place. I don't think he was wagging his finger in her face saying, now, don't you go do that again. I think he was saying, sweet one, you've encountered me and my love for you. I've set you free. This part of you is un burdened. You are now who I created you to be. Go and sin no more. You're released. You're unburdened. I I don't think it was a spirit of condemnation. I think it was a spirit of liberation. And that is what we are inviting us to do inside of us. It is taking what Jesus did outside of us and bringing it to the parts of us that are in pain. And let me tell you, 
we have Pharisee parts that would love to throw stones at our pornography addicted parts and would love to murder them and kick them out and get rid of them and not a affiliate with them. And those parts need our love and compassion and unburdening. And so do the parts that are desperate and on the ground and covered in blood and terrified that keep going back to the pornography or the sexual acting out. And Jesus brings love and the healing presence of his connection and compassion to both that de-escalates the battle and invites healing and unburdening. And that is the invitation to these warring parts of us is to stop fighting, drop the stones, release the terror and the self-righteousness, take a U-turn, be unburdened because you have encountered the God image and go and be who God created you to be. And it's beautiful and it's wildly opposite from how we typically approach addiction healing. Amen. <laughs> Isn't it just like the best thing? Isn't it the good news? Yes, it is. And I'm speechless because what I'm feeling right now is that release. That sense of not needing to strive and also not needing to frantically avoid or protect some part of me. When we have this kind of encounter with Jesus or with Jesus through another person or with Jesus just through the God image within me, there's that lifting of the heaviness, um, the lifting of my face um, because there's love where maybe there wasn't love before. And no amount of legalism can undo the effects of sin and trauma in our lives. And so, Jenna, if we want to access that core self, at Husband Material, we talk a lot about curiosity and compassion and courage because those are the qualities of our core self. That's how we want to relate to ourselves and each other. So how can we have more of that in our lives? Yes. It's such an important question because if all of this is just head knowledge, mm -hmm. it's probably not going to change the day-to-day -day struggles. That's really important. You really helped me with that because when I was asking you about some of the different approaches to therapy, you said talk therapy can only do so much. Simply talking about our issues and, and having an intellectual engagement is really limited in what it can do. I mean, learning about your family of origin and learning about the origins of your sexual fantasies and, and understanding your story is, is all great. And it's incomplete without experiential understanding. Being able to feel it in my heart and in my body. I mean, that's a different, that's a different kind of life. That's right. That's why we can know in our heads, yes, I'm holy, chosen, beloved. We can tape the verses on the mirror all we want. We can repeat the same things to ourselves. Like I am a child of God. I am beloved. I, you know, as far as the East is from the West, but it doesn't resonate in our core without the experience. Our, our cerebral cortex, the frontal part of our brain, is no communicado with the limbic system of our brain and the experience is in the limbic and the experience is where transformation happens and the limbic part of our brain is where our trauma lives so we do not like arm wrestle our limbic system with our frontal cortex and win it doesn't work the frontal cortex is going to lose every single time we don't do what we know we do what we feel if we did what we know, therapists would be completely out of work and the diet industry would be obsolete because we would all eat kale and go to the gym and not be anxious and depressed. Like it's kind of worthless, what I know. I know all those things and it doesn't really change how I feel or what I'm doing. Um, but to experience God 
to experience love versus knowing about God, knowing about love, whole different, whole different experience. And I think it's really important, and I'm so passionate about this, that uh, the IFS model, I would really invite anyone who wants to dig deep um, it, to pick up a copy of the book all together. You, you can grab it on Amazon because I break it down um, in super readable ways and give people a lot of exercises to help them apply it. But I've, I've taken it a step further in the period since I've written the book because the IFS model and the steps of the model can sometimes be a little bit complex uh, for us in the moment. And so what I've done is I've distilled the essence of the, the kind of most powerful parts of the model into three words that anybody can remember and use in the moment to help us apply this today. So we can get a little bit of access to that God image by just remembering three simple words. Um, and so if you'd like, I could sort of walk us through an example of that. I call this idea move toward, I call it actually move toward with Jenna, uh, because to me, this is a movement and it's really a, a spirit led movement, a, a movement of the God image, which is at its essence, love. Like it just comes down to that. Love is what is going to transform. And what we want to do, as I see it, is bring the love of our God image to all of our parts so that if they are carrying burdens, they can transform. And one way that we can do this is with these three steps. And the three words are notice, know, and need. And listeners, if you're driving, if you're doing whatever, you don't have to worry about writing that down because I've got a... a Thing that you can text later and we'll send you all kind of free resources if, if you like this. Um, but notice, know, and need are pretty simple. We can remember that and we can apply it. So what I would say is if someone is recognizing that they have parts at war, kind of this inner group of angry Pharisees that hate the porn addiction and want to kill it and kick it out of the system, and then the part that keeps going back to the porn, so very much the, the Pharisees and the woman caught in adultery. If you've got those parts at war inside of you, let's use these three simple steps of move toward with Jenna to bring the compassion of your God image to these parts rather than moving against each other, which is what they typically do. And they go back and forth moving against each other. Let's move toward them with love and curiosity. So what I would say is just pick one of them. Let's say, let's pick the, the spiritualizer one that really hates the porn addiction, the porn addicted part and wants to kill it. So when you're connected to that part of you, the part that wants to go to therapy, wants to get sober, uh, wants to stop going back to the porn and is horrified about the porn, where do you, step one, notice it in your body? How does it show up? Maybe it shows up in certain thoughts, Maybe it shows up in this sense of resolution. Maybe there's a kind of, you know, strength about, you know, your body experience. Just notice it. And in that noticing, can you bring some loving kindness and compassion to that part of you? Just kind of stay with it, breathe with it until you can connect to some open heartedness and just bring that spacious, connected, loving essence of the God image to this part of you. And when you've got a sense of open-heartedness toward it, then step two is just to literally ask this part of you, what do you want me to know about you? What do you want me to know about how you first learned to try to help me by getting me to do it right using spiritual language? What do you want me to know about what you're afraid might happen if you didn't do this thing and, and yell at the pornography? Yeah. And what we hear when we do that can be so surprising. One time I was feeling the urge to masturbate after recently participating in a group for survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And, and the part came up and I simply practiced this, what we're talking about and noticed, okay, what? what's coming up for me and what does it want me to know? And the message I got was my body was not my own in the abuse that I experienced. 
And the part of me that felt that impulse to masturbate was trying to take back control of my body. You can't have it. It's mine. And so, wow, I was just able to feel my own heart and to validate that part. Like, you're right. You're right, little Drew. Your body belongs to you. And also, as we move through this process, we don't, we don't want to let that abuse continue to dictate our decisions today. You're released. And so that, that simple curiosity can lead such surprising journeys for us. That's right. That's right. Because the, the parts of you and the parts of me and the parts of our listeners that are stuck in these ways of relating or, or behaviors, uh, th those parts of us know when they first started doing it and why. Mm -hmm. And we don't. <laughs> and that's kind of a wild concept. That's why we ask. And don't try to figure it out because the figure it out part is another part that's trying to help us. But when we genuinely are connected to our God image, we're simply curious. What do you want me to know about how you first started to try to help me in this way? And what are you afraid would happen if you didn't take me over and cause me to seek out porn or masturbate or spiritualize? So that's step number two. And the final step, step number three, is what do you need from me right now to feel just a little bit more comforted, a little less activated, so you don't have to take me over and, and cause me to, to want to do these things or, or feel this way? And the answers that we get, and it's not like we're hearing voices or anything weird, but there's just a sense. We get like a memory or an image or a sense of something um, that's what that part needs from us so that so that the part doesn't have to try to lead us in our life, but that the God image can lead us. And at the end of the day, that part is really like desperately wanting to be led by the God image. It just is not aware that the God image is there because most of the time we don't welcome these parts. We're not curious about them and we try to kill them. And, uh, and that doesn't really make them feel very welcome. And the more we do that, the more frantic they get and the more they take us over and freak out and panic. Yeah. And that's why when I'm working with somebody, I will ask, often ask, how do you feel toward this part of you? It's that spiritual MRI that you taught me Yes. to just check if they're relating from the God image. That's right. If they're coming from that place of curiosity or compassion or, or connection, because otherwise it could be re-traumatizing. That's right. So as we ask this question, okay, what does this part need from me? One of the interesting things to me is that sometimes it's something that kind of happens in the imagination. It's not something that I go do like, oh, I'm just going to go call a friend or exercise. I mean, that can certainly be super helpful in bringing care to the whole system. But like, how do you explain the imagination part of it? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes when we ask a part, what do you need from me to feel just a little more comforted right now, a little less activated, we do get a sense of something internal. And very often that sense is something like, I, I need a hug. <laughs> like, I, I want you to hold me and welcome me. It's literally a little one running to Jesus. Mm. And what a little one who's in pain needs is often to be welcomed. And these little ones, when they run forward in our lives and take us over looking for help, they often get attacked by other parts of us that hate them. So they've really never been welcomed. And so very often what a, what a part, um, maybe that's been seeking pornography, what it needs is just to, to be welcomed and not attacked, to just have a place at the table with the God image. Um, and that happens internally. And it, it's a spiritual experience. Of, of a connection to the God image. Um, it is the living out embodiment internally of come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, mm. and I will snuggle you close, sweet one, and give you rest for your soul because this part of you that you've been carrying around that seeking porn is actually not who you are. Let me lift it for you. Yeah. And sometimes they want something in our outside world, but as often as not, it's really something spiritual, wanting to be with 
the God image, which is profoundly healing. Amen. And it's exactly what Jesus said. He said, let the little children come to me. That's right. And do not hinder them. That's right. That is exactly right. And it's our parts that hinder our access to the God image. And they don't mean to, they just don't know any better. And when we can help them develop a relationship with the God image, and I want to be clear, that's an experiential relationship, not a knowing relationship. It's not a head knowledge thing. When we can give them time connected to the loving, compassionate, healing energy of the God image inside of us, it's transformative. It yes. gives relief. It stops the fight and it changes the entire experience internally. Let's go. <laughs> if you're, if you like this idea and you're like, oh, wait, I got to write this down. I really want to remember it. Don't worry about it. All you have to do is text 55444. Hopefully that's easy to remember. 55444. And maybe Drew, you can put it in the show notes and just text yep. the word Jenna, J-E-N-N-A. That's my name to 55444. And give us your email and we will send you a free move toward guided journaling worksheet to help you do this with your own parts. Uh, we'll send you a free audio move toward meditation, one for addiction in general, one for sexual addiction, one for betrayal trauma. Uh, we want to give you all kind of free resources so that this isn't just head knowledge so that you can use it. Go check out movetoward.com which is my website. I've got a gazillion free videos and lots of things. And I take advantage of those because they are free and you have all these great meditations related to anxiety, anger, shame, parenting, sexuality, all these different applications of what we're talking about. And being able to get on there and do a little meditation is a really helpful way of practicing this and experiencing it, not just thinking about it or, you know, reading up on it. So thank you for providing all those. They're excellent. It's my pleasure because I'm really passionate about this because this has changed everything for me. And I want people to not just hear about it and get excited and then forget about it, but actually be able to use it and experience it because I hope, my hope and prayer for everybody who can hear this podcast is that this will be transformational in your life, that you will not only know in your head, but experience that you are good. Mm -hmm. That who you are is not bad. It's good. And that all parts of you are truly welcome. All parts of you have an honored seat at the table. This will truly change the world. And I want everybody who can hear this to experience it. So please take advantage of those free resources. Thank you so much, Jenna. This is awesome. And it also transforms the way that we help others. Yes. Uh, whether you are leading others in a professional way or a volunteer way, or you are just trying to help a friend um, and you're in a small group with someone who's struggling. I mean, this approach is extremely transformative for the way that, that we hold space for one another. That's exactly right. Because usually when people come to us and say, oh, I've got this thing I'm really struggling with, we'll either offer an opinion or give some advice or whatever. Um, but imagine how much more effective if somebody comes to you and says, Drew, I'm really struggling with anxiety. And you say, oh, well, where do you notice that in your body? Where does it show up? Well, what do you think that anxious part of you wants you to know? Huh? Well, what do you think that anxious part of you might need from you right now to feel just a little less activated? Well, holy moly, that's not a hard thing to do, but isn't that so much more transformational? And it doesn't take anything from you and me. We just have to remember three simple words, notice, know, and need. And everybody can do that. And what a gift that we offer to our fellow human beings to just be with and invite them into their own new turn. It's pretty great. Yes. I love this language. Taking a U-turn. Yeah. Thinking as we instead of us versus them um, and, and accessing our core self, the image of God within us and allowing the fruit of the spirit to just spontaneously overflow. Jenna, what is your favorite thing about this freedom? Oh, all parts welcome. 
That's my favorite thing to really know that all parts of me, even the parts of me that feel shame, that feel broken, that, that eat too many Oreos that, uh, you know, get lost on Facebook. Um, all the parts of me are truly good and truly welcome. The experience of that has got to be my favorite part because that's changed my life. And that is the good news. And it is utterly transformational. And I so hope that everybody who hears us will get to experience that themselves as well. All parts welcome. Me too. Thank you so much for being with us at Husband Material. Guys, go check out movetoward.com. Text Jenna. I've got everything in the show notes. And always remember, you are God's beloved son. In you, he is well pleased. Mm -hmm.